Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived the Son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is God's word. Well, no, you haven't been uh, mistaken. It's not Christmas. Uh, but we are trekking through Luke. And uh, we find ourselves in this important passage. Uh, a very familiar passage. It's a passage that deals with the great mystery of how the eternal God who has always existed, comes to us to dwell on this little planet in the Milky Way, in the middle of nowhere, and walks among us. Now, this passage really is full of glory. Glory of something that God has done that only the mind of God could have thought up, really. But this passage is very important because something that is so full of glory concerning the Lord Jesus Christ would you be aware that it has brought so much controversy and so much trouble to Christianity? What do I mean by this? This is a passage about the glory of Jesus Christ, and yet the Roman Catholic Church has turned this to make it about the glory of Mary. Now, yes, the passage has to do with both Jesus and Mary, but what does the text say about both of them? Now, I, I hope that you can um, have a Bible open before you, whether it's on your phone or whether you've got the uh, hard copy of the text. But we need to see what does God say about both of these individuals? What does God want us to see? What is the truth? And may the Spirit reveal it because it is glorious. So let's be good Bereans this morning and we'll look carefully at the text. But before we do, let's pray again and just ask the Lord for his help upon this time. Father, we have just sung, speak, O Lord, and we really mean it. We have come to hear from you, and to hear from you, we now open up the word. We trust and have great confidence that you have spoken. And that, Lord, we pray that you would come and bring it to our hearts with a fresh work of the Spirit, not bringing new revelation, for these are ancient truths, but, Lord, that you would open our hearts and that we would see how timeless this word is. Lord, we pray that you would drive out any heresy, drive out any uh, error concerning this passage, uh, passage this morning. We pray that you may guide us into the truth. Please help me, Lord. Please help everyone hearing that you might be glorified in the truth and that your Son may be honored. This we desire. Amen. If you're taking notes this morning, uh, our first point we see as we look at verse 26, we see the modest setting of the coming one, the modest setting. Now, Luke here 
finally gets into the narrative of the coming of our Lord and he's about to lay out the greatest event in history. He's about to tell us of the greatest story in history. But notice he doesn't begin this story with the words once upon a time. No, no, it doesn't, doesn't begin like that. Rather, we just get some very simple details. Look at verses 26 and 27. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Just a lot of details, right? A lot of information. Now, we uh, reintroduce to a, uh, the angel Gabriel. He has been busy, as we've seen. He was sent on an errand in the last passage to Zechariah to bring news about the coming of John's birth. 400 years we saw God has been silent. Now he's sending the angel Gabriel around. God is on the move. And salvation is unfolding. But Luke gives these details in the, and just start with, in the six months. What's that referring to? In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. He tells us that in verse 36. Elizabeth is now six months pregnant. So this happens then. Luke wants to ground this story in history, in time. It fits on a calendar, on a timeline but he's not happy with just putting it on a timeline. He's concerned about geography. That's what he says. He doesn't say it just happened in the east, but specifically a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Again, because this is not a story of Cinderella or Snow White. This happened somewhere. He says it happened in the region of Galilee. Now, Galilee is about 80 kilometers north of Jerusalem. So if you can picture your map of Israel... It was about 50 kilometers in width, the region of Galilee, just north of Samaria. So when you read of Jesus going up to Galilee and coming down to Jerusalem, he would travel through Samaria, that despised region. But Luke gives us not just the region, but the town. You see it there. A city called Nazareth, which is in Galilee. Now, it's fascinating. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know the Old Testament is not short on names of people and names of places. In the Old Testament, there are some 300 references to different cities and towns, each of them named. Big towns, small towns, 300 of them. What is interesting is in all of those names, Nazareth is never mentioned once in our Old Testament. Nothing, no mention of it. Nazareth was such a small village. It was really tiny. And scholars believe of history that it had about a population of 400 to 500 people in this period. It's so small that Theophilus, whom Luke is writing to, he probably can't even put his finger on on a map. And that's why Luke says it's in Galilee. He tells him the region, a city in Galilee, just to kind of help him out, it seems. Now, Nazareth was truly insignificant. Remember John chapter 1, and Nathanael meets Jesus. Nathanael goes running to Philip and says, we found the promised one that Moses had written about. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. What's Philip's response in verse 46? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? What's Nazareth? Nothing. See, Jesus' setting, the arrival of Jesus, it's all so modest, isn't it? It's very humble. But already Luke is contrasting John and Jesus. The birth and out of announcement of John last week, now of Jesus. What did it say of John? Where does the able go, a, angel Gabriel go? He goes to the religious center of Israel. Gabriel was sent to Jerusalem. And then he goes into the heart of the religious center, into the holy of holies in the temple. That's where he announces John's birth. Where's Jesus' announcement? In, in the middle of nowhere. In a, in a nothing region of Galilee, in a nothing town of Nazareth. There's a contrast already forming. But there's more to the modest setting that we see. The message comes to a virgin, a young girl. Now, there's nothing tricky about the Greek word here. She's a virgin. It means one who has never had sexual relations. Never. This, this girl that is about to receive a message... She's kept herself pure for marriage, for her wedding day. 
Matthew, in his birth narrative, also highlights that she was a virgin. And it says that she was betrothed to a man named Joseph. In Matthew 13, we are told that Joseph was a tradie. He's a carpenter. But Luke gives this also detail that Matthew does. says that Joseph is of the house of David. In Matthew's account, the angel calls him Joseph, son of David. That's going to become important as we move on in the text. Now, it says Mary was betrothed to Joseph. That word betrothed, she's pledged in marriage. Now, to understand this, we have to go back to their culture because their marriages were different to ours. She was betrothed. It's kind of equivalent to our being engaged, but there are some differences. Now, a Jewish wedding had two phases. The first one was this betrothal engagement. Now, it didn't involve giving the girl a ring and, okay, now we uh, have this status of being fiancés. No, no, no. The betrothal period began with a formal agreement of marriage before witnesses. It was a formal agreement. And there was a financial exchange of the bride price. So you had to pay the parents for Mary. Things were exchanged. So already she is now legally his wife in this first phase. Phase two happens about a year later. That's when the wedding ceremony takes place. She is from the ceremony, she's taken to the groom's house where she's taken to the marriage bed and the marriage is consummated through sexual union. That's phase two. Now, when Gabriel arrives, Mary and Joseph are still in phase one, the betrothal period. Now, for a Jewish girl, they usually got betrothed engaged between the age of 13 and 18. Now, she's very young. When we're thinking of this woman, she's very young. Now, this first phase of uh, betrothal, it's very different to engagement because it's not just if you call off the wedding at this point, it's not like just calling off an engagement. If you call off a wedding in the betrothal period, you are filing for divorce. You are. That's why when you read Matthew's account, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, when Joseph hears that Mary's pregnant, what does it say? Being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, he resolved to divorce her quietly. He didn't want her to put her to shame. He sees she's pregnant. They haven't slept together. She's had an affair. That's his conclusion. But he doesn't want her to put her to shame, so he's going to divorce her quietly. But then the angel will sort that out. But at this point of the narrative, what are the details showing us? Just as we're here, what are we seeing? The angel Gabriel is sent to an insignificant and unknown village. More than that, he's sent to an insignificant and unknown woman. Let me quote one writer. He says this, The angel is sent to a nobody in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. It's all so modest, isn't it? Every bit of it. So the announcement of John's birth happens in Jerusalem, in the temple, in the middle of a worship service. The announcement of Jesus' birth happens in the middle of nowhere, in a nowhere town. John's announcement is given to a priest. Jesus' announcement is given to a young virgin girl. You can see the contrast that Luke is setting up here. Now, why is it all so modest? Why is it all so humble? Why is it all so meek? You see, the announcement of Jesus, the setting of Jesus coming, it's going to match his ministry. He will come as the meek one, as a humble one, as a servant. It all reflects of what kind of minister he's going to come as. So before we move on in the text, I have to ask you, do you see in these verses the humility of the setting. Do you see the modest... Um, in verses 20 to 20, do you see the modesty of it all? We've just been going through it simply. How is it then, the question, if this is the tone of the passage, how is it then in the very next verse that the Roman Catholics flip the whole thing on its head and make it about glorifying a human being? Does that match the tone of what we've read so far? I'm just going to stick, I'm just dealing with this as a truth that we need to hear. Okay? Yep. Look at verse 28. Let's continue. 
Now the angel came to her and said, Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. Greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. Now notice a few things here. It says here that she is the favoured one. Now the Greek here is favoured with grace, a recipient of grace, a privileged object of God's favour. Now again, what we're talking about, this isn't to try and tarnish, but we're dealing with things that are of massive importance here. Mary is held up today as one who is full of grace, as a woman full of grace. This is how she's esteemed. But this is not what the word says here. It says that she's a recipient of grace. She is favored with grace. She's not a fount of grace. This is very important because it is taught today that we are to pray to Mary as a channel of grace. Let me read a prayer from this religion. It says, from verse 28, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of death. Do you see what's happening here? This is what is taught. That we are to pray to this woman because she's full of grace. Now, is that what's happening here? Is this a prayer in our passage? This is a greeting from Gabriel. A greeting. And he says, she is a recipient of grace, not a channel of grace. It is also taught that she can, that she can intercede for us that we are to pray to her so that she can intercede for us. What does the Bible teach? 1 Timothy 2.5 There is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We're not to pray to anyone else. This is very important. We do not pray to another. And, and it goes on. It says here, The Lord is with you. See what the, see what angel, the angel Gabriel says? O favor one, the Lord is with you. Now, this has also been taken to say that she is greater than the rest of us because God is especially with her. Do you know this phrase, the Lord is with you? This is what angels said to other people in the Scriptures. The angel Gabriel said this to Gideon in Judges chapter 6, verse 12. The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. What's Gabriel saying, the Lord is with you? He's trying to teach that do not be discouraged what's about to happen. Don't worry about what people say to you. Don't worry about the burden that's going to come upon you. God is with you in this. This is not exalting a woman. Now, these distortions have led to many, many dangerous teachings. Very dangerous. And some of them include that she is completely sinless, that she forever remained a virgin. What do we read in the Gospels? Mary and Joseph had more children. Jesus had brothers. She did not remain a virgin. She's also called the Queen of Heaven who stands at the right hand of Jesus. A co-redeemer with Jesus. Friends, it is so important. We must understand these are teachings of the devil. They really are. Notice what it says here. Look at her response to this greeting. Verse 29. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. She's troubled. She's disturbed by the greeting here. She's not someone of great merit where she thinks, well, I've, I've been entitled to this. She's not expecting this. She's afraid. She's fearful. Look at verse 30. Look what Gabriel says to her. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. What did we see last week? Why are people afraid when angels come? Because sinners are fearful in the presence of sinless creatures. She's terrified, and the angel needs to reassure her. And then what does it say? Verse 30, for you have found favor with God. This word favor means you have found grace with God. Again, she is a recipient of grace. God has been gracious to you. She is not in herself filled with grace that she can give to us if we pray to her. No, 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 no. She's a recipient of grace. This is very, very important. 
You see, as you look at the context, see what's going on. This is all a humble, modest setting. Why? To prepare us for the humble, modest Savior who's coming. That's what the text shows. So our first point, this is the modest setting of the coming Lord. Secondly, we see the majesty and ministry of the coming Lord. Look at verse 31 with me. The angel said, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So like Zechariah, Mary is promised a child. And like Zechariah, this child too has a pre-picked name by God. John had his name already picked by God, which meant Yahweh has been gracious. Now this child is to be called Jesus. In the Hebrew, Yeshua. The English equivalent, Joshua. In Greek, his name is Jesus. The Lord saves. The Lord is salvation. Do you want help? It's in his name. The Lord saves. And there's so much in a name. Matthew 121, the angel says, You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He is Savior. What did we see was a substance of John's coming ministry? What did we see last week? He has a ministry of repentance. He's going to call the people to turn. He's going to call out their sin. He's going to tell them to leave their wicked ways. John, his goal was, we saw, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. John would prepare the people. Jesus would save the people. John couldn't save anyone. John needed a savior. John couldn't atone for anyone. John needed his sins atoned for by a savior. Jesus will come to save the people. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be savior. He's not the savior that Israel expected. But friends, he's the savior that the world needs. Exactly. Call his name Jesus. Jesus, for he will be Savior. So we see at the very outset, before his ministry, before he's even conceived in the womb, what do we see? The shadow of the cross is already hanging over him. You see that? This is why he comes. This is why he's coming. And so please, this morning, you may know Jesus as teacher, leader, healer, religious figure, But if you don't know Jesus as Savior, you don't know him. This is the first step. The angel announces, he comes as Savior. But there is more. Look at verse 32. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. He will be called great. Remember it said of John, John will be great before the Lord. It says Jesus will be great incomparably great, unrivaled in greatness, unparalleled in greatness. And friends, the New Testament backs that up, doesn't it? Do we not see his greatness on every single page of the New Testament? We see in his ministry the greatness of his compassion. Look how tenderly he deals with the sick, the weary and the needy. Do we not see the greatness of his mercy? He comes forgiving the worst sinners of society. What about the greatness of his power? The wind, the waves, nature listens to his voice. Power and authority over sickness, over death, over demons and the devil. They all bow before him. Greatness in authority. Remember when he preached, what did the people say? The crowd said, no one ever spoke like this man before. And then he comes bringing so great a salvation, doesn't he? He comes as the great shepherd of the flock, as our great high priest and our great sacrifice. He comes as the great king, and even his return will be great. What does it say in Luke 21? They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. He is great. That's why he's the theme of our songs. That's why he's the theme of our sermons. That's why he's the theme of our message to the world. He's our hope, he's our peace, he's our comfort, he's everything. He will be great. This is all said before he even arrives. 
And Gabriel adds more, he will be called the Son of the Most High. This is a reference to God the Father. 2 Samuel 22, 14, Yahweh thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. He's the Son of the Most High. When, when we talk about God as the Most High, it's talking about God's authority. Remember Isaiah saw God? What did, how did he see God? I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and lifted up. What's Isaiah saying? There's so many kings on the earth, but there's a throne that's higher than all of them. The Most High sits on it. Jesus is called the Son of the Most High. It's another way of saying Jesus is the Son of God. And he says that in verse 35. Do you see the end of verse 35? He will be called holy, the Son of God. Now again, Luke is making a contrast here between John and Jesus, isn't he? He's setting us up here. John will be the son of the elderly Zechariah. Jesus will be the son of the Ancient of Days. There is a difference in greatness here. And we'll soon see that Jesus is not Joseph's biological son. He is the son of God. As John is the same nature of his biological father, Zechariah, Jesus is of the same eternal nature as his father in heaven. He is the eternal son of God. Eternal. Friends, there is one God in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has always been the eternal son of God. He who is coming into the world is the eternal son of God. See, God, when Jesus' ministry begins, God will say from heaven at Jesus' baptism, this is my son. Peter in Caesarea Philippi will confess, you are the son of God. But who gets to announce it first? The angel Gabriel. What a privilege. What a joy it would have been for that angel, the one who's coming. He's the son of God. The son of God is coming. See, Luke is showing us, despite the humble circumstances, the humble setting, the humble nature of his character, he's nothing short of the highest majesty. And look at his majesty to be revealed. Look in verse 32. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He'll be given the throne of his father, David. You see, that's why at the beginning, verse 27, it gave that little detail about Joseph. Joseph was from the house of David from the line of David. What's all this mention about David? Well, the Old Testament makes mention of a number of covenants, doesn't it? We read of covenants. A covenant in the scriptures is an agreement where God enters into agreement with someone or with his people and he makes them promises. What are some of the the covenants we see? He makes a covenant with Noah. God drowns the entire world. And then afterwards he says to Noah, Noah, I will never do this again. I will never drown the world. And how does it, what's the sign of the promise? You see it in the sky. The rainbow. His covenant with us. And then he makes a covenant with Abraham. He says, Abraham, even though you're such an old man, your offspring will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And through your offspring, one will come who will bless all the nations of the world. He makes a covenant with Abraham. And then... He makes a covenant with David. What we're talking about here. Lindsay had read with us, read for us earlier, 1 Chronicles 17. David was a king of Israel. And God makes a covenant with him and says, David, your throne, your line will rule forever. You will have an eternal kingdom. One of your offspring will reign forever. And now it says in our text, that Jesus will be given the throne of David. Imagine how that sounded to Mary. When Mary's standing there, God had given that promise to David about a thousand years earlier. As Mary's standing there, there hadn't been um, someone from David on the throne for about 600 years at this point. 600 years, none of David's descendants have been on the throne. Mary's probably thinking, hold on a second. Were God's promises yes and now no? Has God's plan failed? And the angel Gabriel says, God's promises aren't yes and no. His promises are yes and yes and yes. The throne of David will be taken. Verse 33, And he will rule, reign over the house of Jacob forever. Jacob is just another name. 
for Israel. He will reign over Israel. And then it says, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The Lord will give to him the throne and of his kingdom there will be no end. Think about it. Just look back over history. Look at the greatest kingdoms and empires of this earth. Think back at Egypt, at Nineveh, at Babylon, at Persia. They all came crashing down. God raised them up. No sooner did he raise them up, no sooner did he blow on them and they were no more. They all had an expiry date. That's what Proverbs tells us. Proverbs 27, 24. Riches do not endure forever, nor is a crown secure for all generations. No one's crown lasts forever, except for the one who's coming, the angel Gabriel says. His crown will last forever. His kingdom will have no end. Why is it so secure? Why will his kingdom not come to an end? What does it say? For the Lord God will give him the throne. God will give it to him. He doesn't get the throne from Israel. The world doesn't vote him in. There is no election ballot. His kingdom is not a democracy. God will put him on the throne. And there will be no successors. It's given to him forever. He is the king. That's why we sang the song earlier. You will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto the ancient of days. Mary was told the king is coming. When we look back, friends, the king has already come. But in a sense, our situation is similar. They were waiting for the king to come. We're waiting for him to return. He is the king. He is the king. Well, thirdly this morning, let us consider the miraculous conception of the coming one. The miraculous conception. Now, Mary somehow, we don't know, but she somehow perceives that this conception must happen before her wedding ceremony. She, she just knows it. Look at verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, How will this happen since I am a virgin? Mary may be very young, but she's not so young that she doesn't know where babies come from. So she asked. Now, you, you may remember last week when Zechariah questioned the angel, what happened? The angel rebuked him, and he was disciplined for questioning. Now, now Mary questions, you know, how would this be if I'm a virgin? But the angel doesn't discipline her here. Why is that? Zechariah didn't believe, and he asked for a sign. He says, how shall I know that this will happen? He did not believe. What does Mary say? Mary's just highlighting her virginity. And she's just saying, God, if, if I need to have this son, if you're saying this, and it needs to happen now, surely you don't want me to sleep with a man that I'm not supposed to sleep with yet. God wouldn't fulfill his promise through sin, would he? So she's simply asking, how would this pregnancy be? It's not unbelief, but how, Lord? And that's why the angel Gabriel gives her the how to her question. Look at verse 35. It's a fair question. And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. You see, yes, this child will go through the natural birth process. And yes, Mary will have to carry this child full term, nine months, like every other mo mother has to. But this child will not be conceived like every other child in history. No, no, there will be a difference. She, this child will not come through sexual union. No, no, no. This child will not have a biological father. How is he conceived? By the Holy Spirit. And do you see the phrase there that we get? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So God in power by the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow Mary. Now that word overshadow is episkiazo, and it literally means to overshadow with a cloud, to cast a cloud over someone. Now it's used in the Old Testament. Remember when they set up the tabernacle and the cloud, the presence of God descended upon the tabernacle and it says Moses could not enter because God had come down. The same phrase is used in the New Testament. Remember when Jesus and three disciples go up the mountain 
and Jesus is transfigured, then it says, and a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son. Now it says that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her. Overshadowing means the presence of God will come upon her and envelope her, the presence of God. Remember in Genesis 2, God scoops some of the dust of the earth and by his spirit he breathes into it and Adam is formed. The same presence of the Holy Spirit is going to come upon Mary and she is going to conceive the eternal Son of God attached now to his nature is going to be fetus, little fetus, minuscule, small. It's going to take on human nature. There's a great mystery here. God doesn't give us all the details, but Luke the doctor says this is enough. He gives us this account. And again, do you see the contrast between John and Jesus? What does it say of John? He will be filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. What does it say of Jesus? He will be conceived by the Holy Spirit. These two are not the same. Now, I want to say this, circling back. The virgin birth is an essential doctrine. And I'm going to say this. It's as essential to Christianity as the resurrection and the second coming. If the virgin birth is not true, then Christianity falls down. Now, why is that? I'll give three reasons. God prophesied that the Messiah would come through a virgin birth. He prophesied, Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. God will come to earth and it will happen through a virgin. God promises. God in the flesh. So if Mary did not give birth as a virgin, then... She was sexually unfaithful. Luke wrote us a lie and the Old Testament and the New Testament are full of error and they're not the God-breathed word. So the virgin birth is essential for that reason. Secondly, if Jesus was the fruit of Mary and Joseph's sexual union, then they brought Jesus into existence. Do you see that? If they created Jesus, it means he's not pre-existent. It means he's not eternal. It means he's not God, and it means he's just like the rest of us who were created from parents. Do you see how the virgin birth, it preserves his deity and his humanity. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit to show us that he is God, but he comes through the virgin woman to show us that he becomes fully man. Only the virgin birth can hold these two important realities together necessary and then third reason why it's essential if jesus was born of joseph and mary then jesus would not be holy look what it says in verse 35 the very last line there and the child to be born will be called holy the son of god why won't he be holy if he comes from joseph and mary every single person born into this world is born a sinner we receive from adam a sinful nature We are born guilty. That is why you do not need to teach a child to do what is wrong. You need to teach a child to do what is right because we inherit a sinful nature. If Jesus is born of Joseph and Mary, he inherits a sinful nature and he is not holy. And friends, he cannot help us. He cannot. Sinful creatures cannot produce sinless offspring. And so Christianity falls if there is no virgin birth. It's absolutely essential. Look at verse 35. The child to be born will be called holy. He will be the son of God. Now, do you notice something there in verse 35? It's so wonderful. Who do you see in verse 35? As you look at that text, who do you see there? I see three people. I see the Holy Spirit. I see the Father the Almighty, and I see the Son of God, the child. All three persons of the Trinity are here. The Bible teaches us, even in the atonement, all three persons of the Trinity are involved. That's Hebrews 9.14. All three persons of the Trinity are involved in the resurrection. That's Romans 1.4. In the incarnation, we see all three persons of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You cannot claim 
Please hear me this morning. You cannot claim to believe in God if you deny the Trinity. You cannot be a Christian if you reject the Trinity. You cannot. You cannot. Well, back to the conversation here between Mary and the angel. Look how overwhelming the news is. Gabriel needs to reassure and encourage her. And he does it in two ways. Look at verse 36, the two ways he encourages her. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. The first way he encourages her, he says, hey, Mary, another miracle has happened. Your relative Elizabeth, the barren woman, the elderly woman, she's become a parent. And then he encourages her with this great truth. Verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. You know, there's so many skeptics of the Bible today, so many critics, so many scoffers of the word of God who laugh at the virgin birth, who think it's a fairy tale and a joke. Do you see how the angel of Gabe, angel Gabriel silences the critics? Nothing is impossible with God. Can the same be said of man? We cannot even control the weather. We cannot reorder the seasons. We cannot add an hour to our life. We cannot turn back the clock and we cannot keep ourselves from death. And yet we would object to God and saying, he couldn't do that. He created this world out of nothing. No tools, no resources, with no one else. All things are possible with God. Let man be silent and God be glorified. All things are possible with God. Jesus will affirm this truth in his ministry. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And let me tell you, if you're not a Christian this morning, all things are possible with God. There is no sinner too dirty. There's no sinner too great. There's nothing that the Savior cannot wash away. Everything is, everything is possible with him. If you believe and trust in him, you will be saved. There is no case too hard for him. And Christian... If you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, this maxim should be put upon your door frames, upon our walls, that nothing is impossible with God. If he is able to make the barren elderly woman conceive, if he is able to make the virgin conceive, then he can bring me through every single trial and opposition and he can bring me safely home. Happy is the Christian who lives by this truth. Nothing is impossible with my God. I believe in the God of the virgin birth. Happy is the Christian who can live that way, who believes that. You will make it. You will. Well, we've seen the modest setting, the majesty in ministry, the miraculous conception, and if I can say one quick word, lastly, the model disciple. Now, we've denounced the wicked and blasphemous teachings concerning Mary. But that does not mean we chuck Mary out. God has put her name in Scripture. And God has something to say about her. We should do well to see what he has said about her. What does he say? Well, look at verse 38 as our text finishes. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What an extraordinary statement. She receives an extraordinary privilege to be the mother of the Messiah. But understand this, it comes at an extraordinary cost. Can you imagine? She becomes pregnant outside of wedlock. Can you imagine what this must mean to her? She doesn't know now if Joseph's going to call off the wedding. Can you imagine how her family and her friends are going to treat her now? Nazareth is a small town. The gossip will be great. And will they even invoke Deuteronomy 22 upon her? Capital punishment for such sexual unfaithfulness. What will happen to her? And what does she say? Her response, Behold, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. What does she say? God, you are master. I am servant. You are the potter. I am the clay. Where you lead, I will follow. 
let it be according to it. Do whatever seems best in your sight. I'm at your disposal. Whatever the cost, whatever happens to my marriage, whatever happens to my reputation, I lay it all upon the altar of God. That's what she says. It's remarkable. Friends, is Mary our mediator? No. Is she the queen of heaven? No. Are we to pray to her? Absolutely not. Does she have grace to give us, to protect us and help us in our time of need? No. Who is she? Friends, she's a fellow disciple. She's a disciple that we can learn from. I am the Lord's disciple. She receives a great privilege at a great cost. Was it a blessing to carry the Messiah or was it a burden? I think it was both. I think it was both. Blessing and a burden. But friends, isn't that pretty much what sums up the disciples' life, if you're a Christian, the greatest blessing we receive to know God and to have eternal life. But guess what? It comes with burdens. We are called to take up our cross daily and follow him. But may we learn from her and say, we are your servants. Let it be to me according to your word. Whatever the cost, wherever you would have me go, whatever you would have me do, I lay it all upon the altar. I am your servant. May the same be said of us and may the truth of God's word prevail let's pray Father we thank you for your word we thank you for the truth we thank you that we can get clarity from it Lord we trust that you have brought clarity by your spirit help us to stand for the truth and Lord help us to contend for the truth for these things are so vitally important. Help us not to play fast and loose with your word. We thank you for all that you have done in sending us your son. We thank you for these truths. May you bless it to your church. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.